First of all, let me welcome all of you to the College of Nursing. Some of you are part of the Villanova community and some of you are not, but you are good friends and colleagues uh, to all of us here. Um, we are delighted that the kickoff for this workshop that will be held tomorrow um, is going to be um, given, uh, this distinguished lecturer uh, will be given by Dr. Maddie Mezzi. Um, when I first knew Maddie Mezzi, uh, uh -oh. I never thought I would be an older adult. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago, and uh, we were both in New York at the time. And I was thinking back, Maddie, that in those days, probably the only book on the shelf that spoke to the care of the older adult was Newton's Geriatric Nursing. Am I right? See, most of the students here would probably think that I knew Florence Nightingale. <laughs> but you know, and I know, that that wasn't the case. So at the time, I don't think any of us, and I was a public health nurse at Visiting Nurse Service of New York, were as impressed with what the needs would be long term in our society for the care of older individuals. Maddie had a spin on that from the very beginning, and her distinguished career, both in New York and in Philadelphia, and now back in New York, uh, speaks for itself. Um, you will hear her introduced in, in more detail, I am sure. But we are delighted to have you here at Villanova, Maddie, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say, because uh, what goes on now is going to very much in influence uh, a lot of our lives in a very short period of time. Uh, we have a growing population among uh, nursing personnel, nurse practitioners, nurse um, faculty, and certainly nursing deans, I can tell you. If you want to be a dean, this is a time to do it because there are a lot of people of our generation who are now moving on and we're hoping that the rest of you are ready to care for us. Uh, I want to thank in particular a, a couple of people who have wanted to have this conference at Villanova for a very long time, even before we moved to this side of the campus, to our new building. And that's Elise Peasy and Betty Keach, among others, but particularly those two. So with them and with our alumna, who now is at Penn, Pam Caccioni, but I knew her by a different name. I knew her as a freshman, um, is working with us and Hartford um, to put this together um, for all of our edification. And so um, I thank all of them for the work they did, and Lynn Desolets, who is our Assistant Dean for Continuing Education, who knows how to put conferences together and always does a great job for us. So I hope you will do what I'm going to do, is sit back and listen to what I'm sure will be a most stimulating talk by a good friend and colleague and former New Yorker <laughs> who is now returned, Maddie Mezzi, and um, who is going to be? Hi. Betty Keach, uh, our faculty member, whom most of you know, will be introducing Maddie. So welcome and enjoy your time with us. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to have this conference. Louise is right. I think that, whoops, I'm sorry. I think the day that I uh, left Penn, because I'm a Penn graduate and Maddie was my dissertation chair, I said, Matt, we have to have, we have to bring her here. So it's taken a while, um, but uh, it, it's well worth the wait, I'm sure. Um, I too would like to thank the members of the committee. Um, uh, let's see, Pam is here, uh, Lise PC, um, Kathy Wallman, and uh, working with um, Lynn Deslitz and the um, Continuing Education Program. I'd also like to thank uh, two sponsors who, will, uh, who are supporting this effort, um, the uh, Geriatric Education um, Center, thank you, <laughs> I, did, I didn't write it out, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and the Ralston Center who generously supported uh, the conference that we're having tomorrow. So um, this is very important, the education um, of the practitioners, as Louise has pointed out, uh, for the future, and that will be the focus of the conference for tomorrow. So let me tell you a little bit about Maddie. Dr. Maddie Mezzi received her, all of her education, I found out, from Columbia University. She too started out as a public health nurse. And then she joined the faculty at Lehman College in New York 
and um, eventually ended up at the University of Pennsylvania. That's actually where the majority of us who work in gerontology in this region um, had the great fortune of getting to know her, to respect her, and to love her. And um, so it's just wonderful to be able to have her here for you guys tonight. While she was at Penn, she directed the Geriatric Nurse Practitioner Program and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Teaching Nursing Home Program. In 1991, Dr. Mezzi became the Independence Foundation Professor of Nursing, of Nursing Education, Division of Nursing, Steinhardt School of Education at New York University. And in 1996 to 2010, she served as the director of the John A. Hartford Foundation Institute for Geriatric uh, Nursing at New York University. Dr. Mezzi has also authored 10 books and contributed to more than 60 publications which focus on advanced practice and bioethical issues related to the nursing care of older adults. In 2009, she was the recipient of the Dara Short Gerontological Nursing Research Award and she is a member of the Academy of Nursing. Currently, Dr. Mezzi is Professor Emerita, Senior Research Scientist and Associate Director of the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing, again in New York University. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mavi Mezzi to you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. So let's see, we're gonna put this down. We're gonna put the mic here. Can you all hear me? So first of all, thank you so much. It is a real honor to be at this really prestigious university with such a long and illustrious history in nursing education. And Louise, thank you so much. It is for me a particular real pleasure to have Dean Fitzpatrick here. Dean Fitzpatrick was present at my orals for my doctorate. So I quiver a little even now when I see her, but she was absolutely wonderful and generous and uh, I will always remember my time and our time together at Teachers College, really a magical time. And to all of the conference planners, thank you so much. And to some old friends here, it is really, really a pleasure. So I really, before I start, I want to get a sort of sense of who's here. So undergraduate nursing students, raise your hands. Oh my goodness, is this instead of a class or something? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, graduate nursing students, okay. Registered nurses working in uh, clinical practice in the community. Great, advanced practice nurses working in the community or in other communities, great. Um, faculty, ah, a whole bunch of faculty, okay, great. Who have I not included in this list? Shout out, yes. Pardon? Pastor Wesley. Okay, terrific. Anybody else? Administration. Administration, health administration, wonderful. All right, well, it is really a pleasure, and I'm going to try to, I think, talk for about a half an hour, maybe give or take a little bit, and then I really would like to engage in a conversation, a discussion, uh, maybe some rebuttal of some of the things I'm gonna say, uh, maybe some of your own clinical experiences that will illustrate or contradict some of the things I'm gonna say, so I'm really, looking forward to um, a discussion. And I was asked to come up with a title, so this is the title, Setting the Stage to Care for Older Americans. And um, I, I thought maybe I would take you back for just a minute to when I graduated from my undergraduate nursing program, and I know this will seem almost impossible, but it was 1960. We did wear caps and bibs and all those terrible things that you don't wear anymore in, in your undergraduate nursing program. But this was a time when care of older adults was really not on anybody's screen, truthfully. Only 9% of the population was 65 and over. 
Medicare was, was just started in 1965, um, and people signed up, almost everybody 65 and over signed up within about four days for Medicare. And along with Medicare, there was a program that was sort of an afterthought that was passed at the same time called Medicaid. And it was called Medi with a hyphen and then CAID. And it was thought, no one actually knew what it would do, but it was supposed to underpin care of poorer older adults. And obviously since then it has taken up an enormous uh, co component of healthcare for older adults. And in, because Medicaid is a state system for the most part with some federal co-sharing, in some states it consumes almost 50% of the Medicaid budget on care of nursing home residents alone. N never intended in 1965. Uh, the cost of Medicare when it was uh, started was $3 a month out of pocket. Um, for those of you who are nursing students, Google it tonight or maybe even now if you've got your phones on and find out what the cost, average monthly cost of Medicare is today. Certainly not $3 a month. And it was really viewed as a bargain rate medical care for the elderly because there was a lot of concern that there wasn't enough care for older adults. Um, in nursing, we were also at a very early stage of thinking about how we would do nursing for the future. And um, in undergraduate nursing education, I was lucky enough to be at one of the programs in the United States that was the first program that taught undergraduate nursing students to do physical exams and histories. And I know now in your undergraduate program, you're all learning how to do assessment, both histories and physical assessment. But I was in the program actually that was the pioneer at Lehman College with Claire Fagan and Diane McGiven and others teaching undergraduate students. And I would always say, to my colleagues in nursing, I have undergraduate students who can listen to chests and can't make beds. And I wasn't really sure if this was a good idea or not. Now I know, obviously, that we can do both and many, many other things. It was the beginning in the 1960s of the nurse practitioner movement, and it began in Colorado where there was a shortage of primary care physicians and so it began as a pediatric public health nurse practitioner and the University of Colorado was at the vanguard of training these nurses who were supposed to substitute for pediatricians and physicians providing care to children, especially children in poverty. The national picture of what an older adult was, if it was present at all, was a very debilitated older adult, take a look at these pictures, especially the one of the older man, who was gonna drain the resources of this country, drag it down in terms of how we were gonna manage the care of people who were clearly not contributing to society, and with a beginning, just a beginning awakening that this was going to be a health care need that the country was not prepared to deliver. And uh, I was lucky at Teachers College, and Louise will remember this, because I was at Columbia at a time when there was, in fact, a strong gerontology faculty not in nursing, but in social gerontology. And they were talking about beginning to prepare practitioners, psychologists, researchers to begin to address the issues of aging. And I was just very lucky to be there at the same time. Well, as uh, Gloria Steinem says, we've come a long way, baby. And um, this is uh, from a wonderful calendar um, of a assisted living and life care community in New Jersey. 
and it's called the pinup boys of Atlantic shores. But clearly in society now, especially as the baby boomers are moving into being themselves aged, i.e. 65 and over, we are having a transformation of what the older population is beginning to look like. And currently today, we have about 13% of the population 65 and over. In Pennsylvania, by the way, about 15.6% of your population is 65 and over. And I, when I looked up the statistics, which I thought was the latest statistics, Betty, it said that Pennsylvania, after Florida, had the largest percentage of people 65 and over. But Betty assures me that West Virginia has taken over, is that right? So you're now the third state with the largest population of people 65 and over. But it's, in, it's uh, quite clear that by 2040, 20%, 20 one in five Americans will be 65 and over, and about half of those people will be 75 and over. And um, if you are now 65 years of age and older, 65 years, you can anticipate on average another 20 years of life expectancy. So those of you in the room who are thinking about retirement, you better think about what you want to do for the next 20 and possibly 30 years. Babies born today have an even chance of reaching their 100th birthday. I mean, it is extraordinary, right? Absolutely extraordinary. And currently, we have 70,000 Americans who are 100 years of age and older. So what do these people look like? Well, obviously, this is a very diverse group. But I don't want to lose the fact that many, many people 65, 75, and 85 years of age and older, are active and healthy. And I was at the New York City Marathon um, in uh, November, and there were many people in their 80s running the marathon. Not walking the marathon, running the marathon, and looking pretty, pretty good. Um, I'm sorry you can't see this a little better. Um, this slide is a group of surfers from California, of course, and they are all 75 years of age and older, all active surfers. Yes, you can go right ahead and look at them. They're all 75 years of age and older. Whoops. Um, people are aging not only alone, but they're aging with a cohort of their friends. And these are three women, all 70 years of age and older, very good friends, and by the way, aging and having friendships is a very good sign for an active and healthy old age. This is a woman over 100 years of age swimming in a pool. And these two, this picture and the next picture are from a wonderful series in the National Geographic about centenarians. And in fact, there are now some studies going on. Those of you who were at GSA may have heard the keynote speaker there, who spoke about studies of centenarians in pockets of the world, what he called blue zones, where people are living much longer than would be expected among their peers. And he started to think through what are some of the reasons that people are living longer? Not just genetics, but what are the other factors? And one of them is staying active and staying involved in your community. So this, if you want pictures of centenarians, get on the National Geographic website and look for their photographs. And you can put in blue zones and some of these photographs will come up. And they're all uh, open source. This picture I just love because this is a lady pumping gas. I don't know if you can get a good sense of it from the slide as it's coming up. And she's over 100 years of age. She is actually a retired nurse. And 
She lives in Loma Linda, California, which is one of these blue zones that I'm talking about. And Loma Linda has um, a, a, a number of things about its community that makes longevity much more prevalent. Um, some of the things I like a lot and some of the things I find somewhat suspect. This is a community of Seventh-day Adventists. So it is a community that has a very healthy diet, a community where people are very active and are incorporated and viewed as valuable in their community, even into advanced old age. So they're very much involved in community projects. Um, and then it has this little thing that I don't like, which is that very few Seventh-day Adventists drink. I always think that a glass of red wine should be added to this, but they also don't smoke. So um, these pockets are not just in places around the world that you see as exotic. We have pockets of people in the United States who are living into advanced old age, and we are beginning to study them and take a look. And this is a picture from a, actually a New York Times article, and it's a picture that I love because these are four sisters. The lady in the red dress in the sofa, so all the way on this side, is over 100 years of age. Her sisters are all right there, the three of them. They're all living independently in the community and um, they're all over 80 years of age. And the reason I love this picture is I have four daughters, and I always describe four daughters as the best long-term care insurance in the world. <laughs> and I think it probably is, because while I'm often on the outs with one or two of them, I try to stay in good standing with a couple of them, hoping they'll take care of me as I age. But the wonderful thing in this article in New York Times was they interviewed each of these um, siblings. And the younger one said, and my daughters, of course, resonate to this, they said, you, she said, you know, no matter how old you get, you're always the baby sister. And that's exactly what she wrote in this article. So, there are a lot of people living healthy lives. And I always try to think about what do we need to think about for healthy lives. And I've given you some of the things, active life, engaged life, good nutrition, good health habits. Um, but one of the things that clearly is a component of a healthy life is cognitive abilities, an ability to maintain your mental capacities. And we are seeing quite a bit of work going on now, looking at how we can prevent dementia, how we can possibly intervene to slow the, the slope of decline with, with dementia, and obviously how to begin to treat some people with dementia. But I always say, just imagine old age without dementia. It changes the paradigm totally. So that the funding that is going into looking at cognitive disabilities is very well spent as basic science. And I think in your lifetimes, you will see some major breakthroughs in how we begin to think about dementias of all kind, but especially Alzheimer's disease. So we've talked about healthy aging, but I want to make sure that we understand that while there's a good proportion of the population that is aging quite healthy, with quite healthy lifestyle, obviously the group of people we see as we deliver care are people with problems with health, some of them profound, some of them early, but clearly people who need our care. And um, we at the Hartford Institute have for a number of years been talking about health care of older people as, uh, uh, care of older people as health care's core business. This is what 
healthcare today is about. And I will tell you that even those of you um, who are planning careers in pediatric nursing, even you will be involved in the care of older adults. And I will tell you a very brief story. We have uh, a program at the Hartford Institute that works with specialty nursing associations, critical care nurses, oncology nurses, emergency room nurses, to help them prepare materials to better care for older adults in their specialty. And we had some money from a funder, and so we invited these specialty nurses to apply for the funding. And we chose carefully the specialty associations we thought would apply. And of course, we left out the pediatric associations because we said they won't want any of this money. And as we are advertising that you can apply for these grants, we get these frantic phone calls from the pediatric nursing associations. And they say, why didn't you put us on your list to apply for this money? So we called them and we said, what are you talking about? What's going on? And they said, we are involved with a lot of care of older adults. We have many children we care for who the primary caregiver is a grandmother. And in fact, in New York City, we have zip codes where the majority of children in that zip code are being raised by grandparents as their primary caregiver, not an adjunct to parents. Um, they said when children are critically ill, the people sitting in the waiting rooms that we have to wade through to get into the critical care unit and the NICU are grandparents. And he, they said, we hear them giving parents advice, and some of it is right, and some of it is terrible. And they said, we need a program like this. And so we actually did fund two pediatric associations. So you're not going to avoid this. You are going to be taking care of older patients. 50% of the nation's hospitals, 75% of home care, and over 90% of nursing home care involves care of older adults. And older people make up the majority of people with cancer, the majority of people with heart disease, the majority of people with urological conditions, ophthalmological conditions. Almost 50% of people in critical care are 65 and over. And in the hospital, those patients who run into the most problems, and I'm sure you have seen this in your clinical experiences, students and certainly faculty are seeing this, are older patients. Older patients in the hospitals are the ones with the most complications. Anemia, needing respiratory th therapy, having urinary tract infections, and pneumonia, and congestive heart failure. Sometimes it is helpful if trying to understand how to configure services for a population to look at other populations. And so I just want to share with you just a minute a couple of slides of what happens in pediatric care. So pediatric hospitals, children are their core business, right? No question about that. Pediatric hospitals announce themselves as children being their core business right in the parking lot. This is the hospital at Long Island Jewish North Shore Medical Center in, uh, in, right outside of New York City. And there's no question with this whimsical statue outside, right, in primary colors, that this is a children's hospital. I dare you to find a hospital in this country that announces that its primary business is care of older adults. If you look at websites of children's hospitals, and we have looked at many websites of children's hospitals, they announce that they are about kids. We're all about kids, this Duke Children's Hospital says. Welcome to Duke Children's Hospital. Our mission is to provide excellence in clinical care for infants and children. I dare you 
to get on the website of your local hospital and see if it says anything about the fact that probably if you eliminate the bassinets and the few pediatric beds that are still hanging around a general hospital, I bet you 60 to 65% of their patients are 65 and over. I dare you to see if it says that anywhere on your websites. Hospitals' response, given that older adults are their core business, is very, very poor. There are no promotional materials and websites showing older adults. They all show babies and children. And by the way, we did a study of this. We looked at lots of hospital websites. And more than that, we looked at the websites of schools of nursing. Now, I, I didn't look at the Villanova website, so you're going to pass here, no matter what it's on it, because I forgot to look. But um, we looked at every baccalaureate program in the country and their website, and we published this, and you can find the article I'm happy to give you. If you were somebody thinking of coming into nursing now, and you use the website to give you a sense of what nursing is about, I am going to tell you that you would, in 95% of cases, be sure that you were going to graduate and be a pediatric nurse. Be sure. In fact, probably a neonatal nurse, because it, I can't tell you how many websites have this beautiful picture. We've all seen it, right? The incubator with a little baby, premature baby's hand, and the nurse's hand on top of it, right? We've all seen it. That is the image on websites of schools of nursing. They do not announce that they're preparing you guys out there to take care of older adults. And schools of nursing mirror nursing and the other health professions generally. There are different numbers as to practicing nurses, but 2.6 million will do. Less than 1% of these nurses have any credentials in geriatric nursing. And by the way, we should not beat ourselves too hard. Medicine, social work, pharmacy, dietetics, PT, OT don't do any better. We have clearly not enough professionals prepared in geriatrics. Now, there are some programs that are starting to look at creating what I call elder-friendly environments. And um, if you want to see some criteria for elder-friendly environments, one of the places you could look is on the um, association, AONE, Association of Nurse Executives website. They have an initiative to create elder-friendly environments in hospitals. The program that we've been most involved with is NICH, which stands for Nurses Improving Care to Health Systems Elders. And this is a program where we're trying to improve the total environment of the hospital so that, and a few nursing homes, we've only worked with a few nursing homes. Um, and to make it elder friendly and to prepare nurses who have credentials so that they can give care to older adults. So the focus is on niche is programs and protocols that are predominantly under the aegis of nursing practice and looking at how to strengthen them to improve the care to older adults. There are in Pennsylvania 12 niche hospitals and I've listed them here for you. I don't know if any of them are nearby or you have clinical experiences in these niche hospitals. But if you did, hopefully, hopefully, care of older adults would be palpably better than it is in other hospitals. And let me tell you what niche does to improve that care. The first is that NICHE creates what are called geriatric resource nurses. And these are nurses that go through a particular educational program. Many of them are certified in gerontological nursing because they sit for that examination. 
and they become the unit resource for a hospital unit around care of older adults. They're the ones that institute rounds on care of older adults, these GRNs. They're the ones that would, for example, if they felt that delirium was not well managed, they would put an educational program and some protocols in place to better recognize, to better prevent and recognize and manage delirium. They're the ones that might lead an initiative on the unit to remove urinary catheters so that you don't have the infections that come with urinary and catheters. They're the ones who would initiate and help the unit limit the number of falls and injuries on the unit. They are backed up typically by an advanced practice geriatric nurse. So that advanced practice nurse helps a group of GRNs to set in motion improved care. And then if they're lucky enough, they, the advanced practice nurse is backed up by an interdisciplinary geriatric team made up of geriatricians, geropharmacists, geropsychiatrists, or geriatric um, advanced practice, psych advanced practice nurses, uh, PTOT, et cetera. The other thing that we see in many niche hospitals are ACE units, or acute care of the elderly units. And these are units that have been redesigned in terms of the environment, the colors, the equipment on the unit, the visiting hours, how people are, receive their food on the unit, and so forth. They have been redesigned with a special lens to improve care to older adults, and often also involve GRNs and advanced practice nurses. Let me just say, I've emphasized niche, but there are other models of care for improving care to hospitalized older adults. There's a program mounted by the Critical Care Hospitalists Association, who are physicians who are looking in, at improving discharge planning and management in critical care for older adults. There are programs that use uh, people who are facilitators to manage the care of older adults. And then obviously, there's the wonderful, really splendid evidence-based work of Mary Naylor looking at transitional care. So niches are not the only model. It's the one we've been doing at the Hartford Institute, and I wanted to mention that. There are also models of care looking at home care, and not so much home care in the home, but management of complex, frail, older adults living in the community. The PACE programs, programs for all-inclusive care for the elderly, have been replicated around the country, and you have one of the prime examples right here in Pennsylvania at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing PACE program, which is really an exemplary program. And if you have an opportunity through an elective or some opportunity to visit the PACE program, I would strongly urge you to do that. So there are other programs that are looking at facilitating the prevention of hospitalization, unnecessary hospitalization for people living in the community. And then there are, there's a new initiative in nursing homes looking at improving care of nursing home residents. And this also, by the way, affects hospital care because one in three nursing home residents is hospitalized in any one year a third of nursing home residents. So if you can improve the care in the nursing home, you can prevent unnecessary hospitalizations. And there are 16,000 nursing homes in this country, and they serve a huge number of older adults, some of them for short periods of time, as we have patients, some of them as end patients at the end of life receiving palliative and end of life care, and obviously some of them long stay patients. There is a major initiative in nursing homes now to change the culture of nursing homes, to make them more like homes, 
And this initiative is called Culture Change or Resident Directed Care. And I don't know if you're able to have experiences in nursing homes which are undergoing culture change, but they are really quite dramatic to watch how they alter the paradigm of how we view these very frail older adults and rethink how we create an in recreate an institutional structure to more mimic a home structure. So you might want to take a look at some of the issues of culture change, and I'm going to give you some references of where you might look. And they all involve ha how reconfiguring dining, reconfiguring bathing, reconfiguring how staff are deployed so that there's primary nursing and primary assignments for nursing assistants. We have developed at the Hartford Institute quite a few resources for students and faculty to move into re-looking at some of your courses and how you teach to incorporate content that is evidence-based and up-to-date. And I am not standing here as a long-term faculty in undergraduate education to suggest a curriculum revision. In fact, the last thing I'm suggesting you do is a curriculum revision. Matty Mezzi has a, a, a long history of leaving one job to go to another at the time that curriculum revisions are about to take place. So curriculum revisions are not my favorite activities. But every course you're teaching, every place that students are seeing patients, they're seeing older patients. You need to put on the lens of how you can augment that experience, not go to a new place, augment your current experience to make students sure that students have a lens through which they filter that if I'm taking care of an 85-year-old person and I'm doing exactly what I'm doing with a 40-year-old person, I am doing something wrong, okay? That is the message. Taking care of an 85-year-old person the same way you take care of a 40-year-old person, you are providing, nurses hate when I say this, bad care. Not evidence-based care, not scientifically-based care, and certainly not humane care. So, I would like to just urge you that you are not alone in trying to rethink how to bring this lens into your educational situations. And there are many resources from the Hartford Institute. There are many resources from programs funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. And you have several really strong places in Pennsylvania to look. You have, first of all, the, own, the resources of your faculty here at Villanova, and you have great strength here in Villanova. And this is an example of the Try This series, and we try to update these every three years. Some of them have a 2008 date. We're just about to update them. There is a companion series to the Try This series, which shows you how to do these instruments. These are videos using real nurses and real nursing students in real clinical settings. So if you say to yourself, I'd like to use the delirium assessment instrument, the CAM, but I don't really know how to do it, you can look at the video and it shows you a nurse administering the CAM. And then it has a little discussion. How did it feel? What were the pitfalls in doing this? So you're not alone out there. If you're teaching or you're a student in an area of specialization, oncology, critical care, um, you're thinking of, you're in the perioperative area. We have worked with a number of specialty associations and they have resources for their specialties. You can access them directly on the specialty site, or you can come to Consult Jerry RN and look at the specialty button 
and it gives you a drop-down menu, it takes you right to these materials. Many materials, hospice, infusion nurses. And then there are other resources on the Hartford Institute site that might interest you. As students, we have a Bill of Rights for hospitalized older adults. You might take a look at that and see how well it matches what you think care is looking like in your hospital. We have hospital competencies, and then when you graduate and you've worked for a while, and I hope you begin to think about certification in gerontological nursing, we have a review course for you to um, uh, prepare for that certification. And we have a coalition of geriatric nursing organizations. Many of these websites also have really useful information for you about care of older adults. All of these available through the Hartford Institute website or through Consult Jerry RN. And all of our e-learning materials are available on our e-learning site, including material, well, maybe I have a slide on that. Let me wait for just a minute. In nursing education, and you are going to hear much more about this from Joan Stanley tomorrow, who's here from the American or, uh, Association of Colleges of Nursing, thank you, Joan, um, with which we've partnered over a number of years now to really produce some very wonderful materials that are available on the AACN website and our website at the Hartford Institute. But we have been preparing materials for undergraduate nursing education, including now competencies for baccalaureate nursing programs and recommendations of how to implement those competencies in baccalaureate nursing education. And if you look at the National League for Nursing website, which is the other organization involved in undergraduate nursing education, they also have an initiative called ACES, to help faculty and students integrate care of older adults. One of the things we've been very interested in is the clinical faculty. How many faculty here serve as clinical faculty, take students into the clinical area? Okay, great. So the nursing students will tell you, I think, if you're still telling faculty the same things, okay? that it's great in the lecture, and yeah, it's fine, everything's good in the lecture. But where everything comes together, where content is made or broken, is in the clinical site. That's where it happens. And unfortunately, we sometimes, I would say often, have very good lectures on care of older adults, and then we send the student out with a clinical faculty member who has had no preparation in geriatrics. And they've managed to undo almost everything we teach in class in about three seconds, okay? Doesn't take long for the undergraduate student to understand, boy, this was taught in class, but it's not really important on 4 North because the clinical faculty doesn't value it. So we have developed some modules to help clinical faculty integrate geriatrics, and they're available on the Hartford Institute website. One focuses on hospitals, one focuses on nursing homes, and a third one focuses on advanced practice nursing programs. And we have developed modules to help faculty select and use nursing homes as clinical sites, hopefully to improve the experience for students, which we know is still problematic. Students and faculty still have a hard time understanding how to maximize the experience in nursing homes. And these modules were developed with several people around the country. There's two modules on culture change and resident-directed care. And there is, the sixth module is prepared for nursing homes to try and understand whether they're ready to be a clinical site, and also to ask faculty questions to see if the faculty is really prepared to bring students to a nursing home. 
because nursing homes complain a lot about faculty bringing students to the nursing home who have actually never been in a nursing home before. So they go both ways. And all of these modules can be accessed on the Hartford Institute website. Um, and we have had webinars around all of these modules. And those webinars are archived on the American Association of Colleges of Nursing website. So you can go to the AACN website for the webinars that are archived on that website. I'm only going to say just a second about some of the initiatives of advanced practice nursing, because Joan is going to talk about this extensively, and she talks about it much better than I do. But there are major changes now in how we're going to prepare geriatric nurse practitioners and clinical specialists, because as of 2015, we are going to combine these programs so that there is one graduate, and she's going to be called, or he's going to be called, an adult slash gerontological nurse practitioner or clinical specialist. And that is very much going to change the number of nurses at the advanced practice level who can take care of older adults. And we have competencies from that, and we have some resources to help faculty transition the curriculum into this new model. Some of these are available on Consult Jerry, and as you can see from this site, some of these materials are available through the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. So in conclusion, um, we have taken the position at the Hartford Institute that geriatric healthcare professionals and nurses are not born. When I started in nursing and I said I was a geriatric nurse and people would say, well, how come? And their assumption was it was because I liked older people. Now, hopefully, you're not a geriatric nurse and don't like older people. It's probably not a good idea. But um, it's not enough. It is not enough. There is now a science around the care of older adults. There is evidence-based practice around the care of older adults. There are ways to take care of older adults that are right, and there are ways to take care of older adults that are wrong. And if you don't understand that, you are dangerous in your clinical area, and you are not practicing to the full extent of what you have been prepared as a nurse. So hopefully we are creating a new generation of prepared nurses to take care of older adults. And Louise, I feel just the way you do. You guys had better be good, because you're going to be taking care of me. Thank you very much.